It's a terrifying thing to be on a sinking ship. Often, everything happens so fast that it's hard to focus on what you need to do to survive. But this story isn't just about a boat sinking, it's way worse than that. It's about one of the worst things you can imagine happening once you hit the water. As always, viewer discretion is advised. In the summer of 1858, London was hit by something known as the Big Stink. It was particularly hot that summer, and the Thames, which is the large river which runs through London, was essentially an open sewer. Now, London did already have a sewage system that covered and redirected several rivers to flush waste through underground passageways, but these still just emptied directly into the Thames. Even worse, by 1858, this system was in need of a serious overhaul. This meant that gas was often leaked, especially on hot days, and even though it moved the waste away from where people lived and worked, it was still dumped into the Thames, where it would just pile up on shore. On hot days, this smell would become unbearable. In fact, Michael Faraday, one of the most influential scientists at the time, once wrote that, quote, the feculence rolled up in clouds so dense that they were visible at the surface, end quote. And unfortunately, that summer, it was hot every day. This was also before germ theory, and the prevailing idea was that disease was spread by miasma or foul smells instead. And so it was assumed that many outbreaks of cholera and other diseases that plagued the city must be linked to the stench from the waste problem. Proposals had been made for years for an overhaul, but up until then had been put off due to cost. But finally, the big stink made officials realize the urgency of the problem. Afterward, a plan was made to divert the waste away from central and west London, where much of the royal family and nobility lived. In London as well, the prevailing winds blow from west to east, so if engineers could control the flow of waste and pump it out in the east, they could limit the smell to just that end of the city. This would also mean it was closer to where the Thames met the sea, which was the natural outflow area anyway. So next, a series of elaborate pumping stations were built to shift the rivers of excrement farther east. One of the more visually stunning of these was called the Cross Nest Pumping Station, and inside was a series of gigantic pumps that moved waste from the sewers below into a massive reservoir. Then, when the tide started to go out, that wastewater would be released into the river and carried away to the North Sea. Or at least, that was the plan. Often, it still just hung around in the river, making East London an unpleasant place to be. This was partially due to the sheer volume that was pumped through. Like, for example, on September 3rd, 1878, Crossness released 31.7 million gallons of untreated human waste into the River Thames. That same day, William Alexander Law was working as a steward on a ferry known as the Princess Alice. The Princess Alice was an impressive ship at 220 feet long and weighing 432 tons. It was licensed to carry as many as 936 passengers if the water was smooth and regularly had nearly that many on board. William's job was to look after passengers and to ensure the catering ran smoothly on board and the shifts he worked varied. This is because the Princess Alice could run any time from early in the morning all the way to what were known as moonlight trips, which ran late into the evening. That day, he was on a trip from an area known as Swan Pier near the London Bridge to Sheerness, which is right at the mouth of the Thames and then back again. Now, in addition to these varied trips, in the late 1800s, the tickets that passengers could buy gave them access to any London steamboat. And so it was common to get on and off at different stops all day, kind of like a modern day bus transfer. This also meant it was difficult to know exactly how many people were on board at any time. In addition, in 1878, the Thames was actually busier than it is now. The river had fewer bridges to cross back and forth otherwise, so people used the waterways to get around instead. Until 1850, the most common way was in a rowboat taxi, but by the later 1870s, these had all but disappeared and were replaced by steamships like the Princess Alice. Then, in addition to the passenger vessels, there were also lots of merchant ships. In 1870, the British Empire was at its peak, and so the London docks were the busiest in the world, able to handle as many as 500 ships at a time. Then, on top of just being a method of transportation, these ferries were often kind of like short cruises. People would get all dressed up in new coats and hats, and then they would enjoy the live music, saloons, and bars as they made their way from place to place. That evening, William was working in one of the saloons, and at first there were about 15 people inside, but as the night went on, more people came in to get out of the cold. One of these passengers was the 14-year-old daughter of a reverend. The reverend had taken his son and daughter out for the day to see the gardens. As they set off from the pier, it got too cold for her, so she headed down to the saloon to keep warm. Another man named James was on board for a day out with his mother and aunt. Then there was also Henry, who was on board with his wife for a short break. They had first-class tickets and were traveling in the upper four-deck saloon, 
Henry was also surprised by how many kids were on board and how well behaved they were. Then there was also another man named Harry and his brother-in-law who had just gone to Sheerness and back. As it got cooler out, Harry stayed outside to enjoy the band while his brother-in-law went in the saloon, like many others, to stay warm. Now, before we get into this next section, I just want you to be aware that there are going to be several crisscrossing storylines. They're going to be told sequentially, but in reality, keep in mind that they're all basically happening simultaneously. By a little after 7pm, the sun had set and it was getting quite dark out, and Henry watched as the ship made its way around a bend in the river. As it did this, it traveled along the south side of the river to take advantage of the calmer water caused by the bend, because it was now traveling against the evening tide. As it pushed its way through the water, Henry spotted a large ship in the distance that seemed to be heading toward them. This was apparently alarming enough that he even asked the crew if there was any chance that they might be hit, but the crewman assured him it would just pass by. At about this time, the reverend had sent his son to go get his daughter because their stop was coming up. The ship Henry had seen was a ship known as the Bywell Castle, which was a steam cargo ship powered by a traditional screw propeller. It was built to cross the ocean, so it was both bigger than the Princess Alice and more than a thousand tons heavier. In fact, it was only in the Thames at all that day because it had just been repainted at a nearby dry dock. It was commanded by Captain Thomas Harrison, but at the time, an experienced Thames pilot was at the helm instead. This is because the captain didn't have experience sailing down the busy Thames in the dark. The Bywell Castle also had a large raised section on its bow, known as a forecastle, which made it difficult to see directly in front of the ship. So instead, a crewman was stationed on the forecastle to keep watch as they made their way through the busy river. As the Bywell Castle continued in the opposite direction, the pilot caught a glimpse of the Princess Alice's red lights to the right of them and assumed it was just going to pass by them. At some time between 7.20 and 7.40 p.m., the captain of the Princess Alice was standing at the front directing the helmsman, and then, for reasons that are still a matter of historical debate, the captain ordered the ship to cut across the river. Crucially, this was directly in front of the path of the Bywell Castle. Then, just a few moments after he gave the order, the passengers heard the captain shouting in panic. Immediately, everyone turned their heads at once to look, and they all saw the tall mast of the Bywell Castle coming out of the darkness. The pilot on the Bywell Castle immediately ordered a full reverse and tried to steer away, and at the same time, the captain of the Princess Alice tried to turn back south, but unfortunately, it was too late. Harry then watched from where he was standing as the Bywell Castle impacted and sliced directly into the Princess Alice, cutting it almost in half. From that moment on, the ship descended into chaos. A moment later, the Bywell Castle, which had its engines in reverse, began to move backwards, separating the two ships and causing water to flood into the Princess Alice. Down in the saloon, William felt the boat jolt for a second time. This time, it was even more violent and passengers began to panic, so he ran onto the deck to see what happened. As he came on deck, he heard more screams from passengers, saw the split deck from the impact, and then heard the sound of rushing water. He then ran back into the saloon to tell the passengers to come on deck because the ship was clearly sinking. At first, Harry followed William and the rest of the crew, hoping they had a plan. Then when it became clear that they didn't, he watched the chaos as hundreds of staff and passengers desperately tried to grab onto anything they could. At the same time, above Harry and William, the crew of the Bywell Castle began throwing anything they could into the river for people to cling onto. This included ropes, buoys, wooden planks, and anything that might float in the river because the Princess Alice was sinking alarmingly fast. The captain of the Princess Alice then ran to the back of the ship and got every crew member he could to help lower the life rafts. When the first two lifeboats hit the water, people immediately swarmed them, so much so that between their heads and the tops of their hats, they completely obscured the water from above. Crowds of people also fought over each rope that the Bywell Castle's men threw over, and some managed to climb on board, but others only managed to hang on briefly before falling into the water below. Several minutes earlier, the Reverend had just sent his son to get his daughter, but before he even had a chance to look for them when the crash happened, he was thrown violently into the water. At some point, he managed to grab a cable hanging from the side of the Bywell Castle and just held on for dear life. It's not clear how long he held onto that cable, but at some point, a smaller boat managed to pull alongside him and pull him in. Tragically, neither of his kids made it off the Princess Alice. While all of this was happening, Harry was frozen in place on deck. He was just so terrified and figured there was no way he could get safe with so many people dying all around him. Then, in just a few minutes, the water covered his ankles, then his knees, and then he was underwater. But this wasn't just cold water. This was raw sewage, tons of it, and it bubbled on the surface and the stink filled the air. Survivors later told the press that the smell and taste of the water were too revolting to describe. Samples taken later were apparently so disgusting that a boat carrying members of the Board of Inquiry couldn't keep a single open vial in the immediate vicinity. 
And even worse, that sample wasn't taken immediately after a discharge like there had been on September 3rd. But despite how disgusting the water was, there was only one way off the Princess Alice. Before he knew it, Harry was under the putrid water, flailing around for anything that would keep his head above water. Miraculously, one of the buoys thrown from the Bywell Castle landed above him, so he grabbed it and waited until a small rowboat dragged him to the shore. Unfortunately, though, he never saw his brother-in-law again. Meanwhile, Henry up in first class took his wife by the hand, and they both ran to the back of the boat, desperate to find safety. By then, there was a large gap in the middle of the ship, and as they tried to find a spot to cross, there was a huge jet of hot steam. This was because, in the collision, the ship's boilers had been damaged. Then, before they could find another way to cross without getting scalded by the steam, the part of the ship they were standing on dropped from underneath them. Henry and his wife then sank underwater, holding tightly to each other's hands. In another part of the ship, just before it disappeared under the water, William was with a woman he was helping off the ship. He told her to make a jump for it before it fully sank, but she couldn't swim, so he picked her up, threw her over his shoulder, and then jumped off the side. William was a strong swimmer, and he figured he could swim back over to the shore. But tragically, in their heavy Victorian air clothing, halfway to the shore, the woman slipped under the water. William dived down and tried to drag her back up, but it was useless. As he surfaced, he spotted another man struggling to keep his head above water and managed to get a hold of him. He then stayed with the man, treading water until they were both rescued by a small boat. Several minutes earlier, when the crash happened, James saw the Bywell Castle hit the Princess Alice, but at first it wasn't clear how bad the damage was, so he headed toward the saloon to find his mom and aunt. But then, before he even reached the saloon, he was ankle deep in the filthy water, which was rising incredibly fast by the second. So with no other option, he turned around and went to the side of the boat and grabbed onto some chains that had been dropped by the Bywell Castle. Unfortunately, in everyone else's panic, he was knocked from the chains and plummeted into the water below. James couldn't swim either, so he immediately began to flail around for anything to hold onto, and luckily, his finger caught hold of a piece of wood. He then pulled himself onto it and out of the water, and then he made his way over to the side of the Bywell Castle and called for a rope. Luckily, one of the crewmen saw him, and he threw one down, and then James was pulled up to safety. Meanwhile, Henry and his wife surfaced, and both began to panic as well, because neither knew how to swim. Henry was trying desperately to keep his wife afloat when she spotted a plank drifting by, and thankfully, they grabbed a hold of it. Afterward, they floated away from the Princess Alice through hundreds of people thrashing about in the water, desperate to save themselves. The water was apparently so thick with people that many were pushed under by others as they struggled to survive. They eventually reached the side of the Biowall Castle, where they were able to grab some ropes thrown over the side. Then, they drifted with the ship for some time because in the darkness and the chaos, the crew didn't see them hanging down below. By the time the Princess Alice went down, dozens of smaller boats had come to the area and were going back and forth to rescue whoever they could. Sometimes, they even had to knock people off with oars or risk being pulled in or having their boats flipped over. All the boats could do was grab whoever they could and then head back to the shore as fast as possible. Quite a few of these even came close to Henry and his wife, but thankfully, finally, after half an hour of clinging on, one of these boats made its way to them and dragged them and a dozen or so others on board. They then rowed them to the safety of the shore. In addition to all the smaller boats, just a quarter mile behind the Princess Alice was the Duke of Tech, another London steamboat ferry. It was actually close enough to see the ship's glide and immediately went to offer help. Horrifyingly though, already by the time they reached the accident, the waters were filled with people who were no longer moving. The Princess Alice is thought to have been completely submerged under the water in about four minutes from the point that it was hit by the Bywell Castle. By the time just the third lifeboat was launched, it was too late. The passengers who went down with the ship had either swamped the first two life rafts, been rescued by other vessels, or simply disappeared under the water. The last lifeboat was empty, and the other two, while able to hold as many as 70 people each, only saved about 40 between them. Even so, many survivors owed their lives to either the Duke of Tech, the crew of the Bywell Castle, or many of the watermen who headed out in small boats to pull people out of the river. In the hours and days following the disaster, bodies began washing up on shore along the length of the Thames in different areas. Many of them were eventually collected and laid out at the London Steamboat offices at Woolwich, close to the site of the disaster. To add to the tragedy, children who survived searched desperately for their parents, and parents looked for their children. In one example, after finding his way to a bank, one boy asked for some money to find his way home to his mom and dad, but tragically, his parents had died in the disaster. And as word continued to spread about the disaster, relatives began to make their way to Woolwich to look for their loved ones, but for most, it was the worst possible news. In other cases, entire families went down with the ship with no one to come looking for them. 
A week after it went down, when divers entered the sunken Princess Alice, they found that the cabins were, quote, full of bodies standing erect and packed together at the points of exit where they must have crowded in the struggle to escape, end quote. And apparently others were still sitting, almost as if they knew they couldn't get out. William, Henry, Harry, and the Reverend were four of the 178 passengers known to have survived the collision, and William was one of only two crew members to make it. Officially, the death toll was estimated to be around 600, but more recent research puts it anywhere from 719 to 756 people who didn't make it out of the sewage that day. Even more horrifyingly, many of the passengers who survived but swallowed the open sewer that is the Thames reported feeling sick for weeks afterward. There are even some reports of people who died after accidentally consuming the water. Apparently, even the brand new hats and coats found all along the river had to be burned because they were so toxic. Later, a salvage team managed to float the front half of the Alice to recover more of the people who didn't make it, and in a strange twist of fate, as they did, the Bywell Castle passed by. It was sent back to London while investigations continued. A later inquiry found that there were several causes for the gravity of the disaster. First, it found that there were too few staff and safety measures for the number of passengers on board. It also found that the captain of the Princess Alice made a grave navigational mistake, but that the Bywell Castle also shared some responsibility for not reversing and changing directions quickly enough. In addition, following the disaster, the decision was made for the sewage to get purified before being pumped out into the river, and a further amount of the sewage was transported by boat directly into the sea. And finally, the rules governing how boats operate on the Thames were changed so that nothing like that could ever happen again. And it wasn't until 1989 that it did, but that's for another time. If you made it this far, thanks so much for watching, and I want to say thanks again for all of your great suggestions. I've learned of so many incredible stories that I never would have found otherwise from all of you, many of which are going to be videos on the channel. So if you have a story suggestion, feel free to submit it to the form found in the description, and hopefully I will see you in the next one.